You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney and this is my first glimpse of the 2016 Vuelta a España. I've taken over from Richard Moore to see the Vuelta home. Uh, Richard has left the race and I'll be joining Daniel Free for the final week. And where am I? Well, I'm actually standing on French soil. Uh, the Vuelta a España has made a little hop over the border and I'm at the bottom or towards the bottom of the final third category climb. There's around... Uh, well, there's certainly into the final 30 kilometres now. The breakaway, which has been away all day and has a huge advantage, has just swept past. It's obviously broken up a little bit on the climb, um, but they're all broadly in touch with one another as they flew round the corner. Um, and the lead that they have over the peloton is, well, the last time check was over 19 minutes, almost 20 minutes. So uh, there's certainly no chance that the break is going to get caught. It's all about who is going to win the stage now. And it will be one of those 12 men. In there is Sergei Lagutin of Katusha, who won a stage a few days ago. Uh, also in there is, uh, I think I caught a glimpse of Yellow Wallace of uh, the... Oh, goodness me, this is testing me. Get a copy of the start sheet here. Um, of Lotto Sudal. He was, in fact, off the front with uh, Gogol of Tinkoff. They were just a little bit clear, those two of the rest. Yves Lampert of Etiquet Quickstep is also in there. Tom Stamsnyder of Giant was in there. Whether that group comes back together, uh, I don't know. Well, nobody knows. That's the beauty of bike racing. Um, I'm going to be here for quite a while, though, waiting for the bunch to come past. That's at least another 19 minutes, and then I will be heading to the finish to catch up with Daniel Freed. Did I hear somebody speaking English? Were you speaking English? Yes. yes. Hi there. Hi. I'm Lionel from the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hi. Here covering the Vuelta a España. Yes. Uh, tell me your name. Uh, my name is John Garoni. And are you here on holiday or do you have a house there? I'm here on holiday and to visit family. Marvellous. Whereabouts are you from? I'm from California. Beautiful. Um, and uh, tell me about your family here. Where do they live? Live in Aldudes and Esnacio. And are you ordinarily cycling fans, or is it just a happy accident that the race is here? Well, I'm, I'm a cycling fan. I cycle. So when I heard it was going to be close, I said, I want to go down and see it. So and, uh, I follow it in the, in the States. I've watched the Tour de France, and, and then the Vuelta they show in the States now, so I watch it also. Have you ever seen the Tour of California? Yes. I came through our city. And uh, so uh, one of the fellows that owns a cycling shop got me in, and, and so I was able to see him. And they, they go up the hill faster than I go straight. <laughs> well, well, that's true for me, too, certainly. Uh, I think there's quite a wait before the peloton comes past. The gap's 19 or 20 minutes, I think. Oh, so, okay. so there's a little while, but I, I won't spoil your view of the race. So, I mean, what were you expecting? Because it's very quiet, quite low-key here, isn't it, out in the countryside? Yes, yeah. It's really, really nice. When I see normally... Uh, you see the big city, so you see all the crowds and people crowding the cyclists. So this is much nicer. It's it's a little more laid back and not so crowded, much better. I was quite surprised to see here the, uh, they brought um, some of this plastic tape yeah. to barrier off to make sure that the riders only use the left-hand side of the road coming down this descent. It's a fast one, isn't it? Were you surprised how quickly they came around that corner? Yes, I've seen them race you know, downhill before, so I knew they'd be coming through pretty fast. I was kind of surprised they put the tape up because I thought maybe if somebody overshot the turn, they'd use this kind of as an escape, but I guess you don't have a chance to over, overshoot the the turn i think if you overshoot the turn here you go over the wooden yeah, barrier exactly. and it looks a little bit like a drop over the other quite side there maybe down. why they did it yes exactly it's quite a ways down have you managed to do any cycling while you've been over here you no, got a bike with you i didn't bring my bike unfortunately so it's stunning around here though isn't it it's beautiful country beautiful countryside and and where we're from it's it's uh, it's much arid much more arid and and uh, it's very dry uh, matter of fact we've been in a drought so we're, they kind of water ration and so this is wonderful to see all the green 
And what about tomorrow, finally? Um, the race goes up to the Col d'Orbisque. Will you get another chance to see it tomorrow, do you think? I don't think so. I think this will be the only chance I'll get to, to see it. Well, enjoy it when the peloton comes past. I think it will be pretty spectacular. 180 guys trying to get around that corner. No, it's going to be wild, isn't it? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Appreciate it. The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. So at least 18 minutes after the break came past, the peloton is sweeping round this corner. The gendarme blowing his whistle, gesturing for them to all stay over on the left-hand side of the road. Movistar are all at the front looking after Alejandro Valverde in green and Naira Quintana in red. Everyone safely round the corner and they're followed by the team cars. Always looks like the team cars are going quicker than the riders, but obviously they're not. They're going at the same speed, but uh, suddenly the cars come herring past, taking the corner quickly, more quickly than you probably would when you're driving yourself. And so I suppose that tells you just how quickly the riders are going. So the race has gone past. The gendarme will be opening the road shortly and I'll be able to get to the finish where I'll meet up with Daniel and find out what has happened in the race. Daniel, I made it, but it wasn't without a little bit of drama. I had quite an epic day getting from Bilbao to... Epic? You've only been here, You've only been here 10 seconds and you've already <laughs> used the word epic. I have, well... Fallen foul of the epic police. <laughs> well, I'll tell you all about it later on in the episode, but um, didn't see an awful lot of the finish of the stage, but here we are in the Basque country. We're in Echela, which is kind of the middle of nowhere, but this hotel, which is where the Cannondale Drapak team are also staying tonight, is uh, the hive of activity, isn't it? Several restaurants, all busy, bustling atmosphere. It is, and it's a very beautiful part of Spain, isn't it? I mean, people might have certain images and uh, preconceptions about the Basque country. They might think of the, the sort of mining tradition there is in the Basque country uh, and they might imagine it to be quite grimy but this part of the Basque country in particular is a bit like the the, the Switzerland of Spain isn't it all very very polished beautiful little um, cute quaint villages everything very clean and um, very beautiful scenery as well stunning scenery and it was another stunning day on the Vuelta um, a quick recap of the day in the tale of the Etapa stage 13 Lampre's Valerio Conti won it was the longest stage of the Vuelta 213 kilometres from Bilbao to Urdax Dancha Rinea um, the 23 year old Italian was part of a 12 man break that got a whopping lead over the peloton it was 18-20 minutes for most of the day and they finished in fact over, almost 34 minutes ahead of the peloton some of the other riders Riders in the break were Sergei Lagutin, who won a few days ago, Yella Wallis of Lotto Sudal, Yves Lampert of Etix, Tom Stamsnyder of Giant, uh, Cesare Benedetti of Bora Argon, Michael Gurgle of Tinkoff and Daniel Wiss of BMC. Wiss was eventually second. Um, on the final cli- little climb, Lagutin and Wallace had a narrow advantage over the rest of the break, but they were brought back in and then there were several attacks all going off, but nothing stuck until Conti made his move with around 19 kilometres left. Really impressive solo effort. And by the finish line, his lead was 55 seconds over the rest. No change overall. Um, The peloton really did have a bit of a day off. We'll talk about why that may have been in a bit. Um, Tomorrow, into the Pyrenees and into France, going to Gourette, which is on the Col d'Orbisque. So somewhere, well, somewhere I've been before and uh, looking forward to seeing the climbers back in action. But, Daniel, it struck me today, the victory for Valerio Conti, um, the latest rider to kind of make his breakthrough here at the Vuelta a España. He's the eighth rider to win his first Grand Tour stage in this actual race. The others being Gianni Meersman, Lillian Kalmajan, Simon Yates, Jonas van Genechten, Sergei Lagutin, David de la Cruz, Jens Kukulair. So it's a real first-timer's Vuelta, this, isn't it? Well, you're trying to say the standard is rubbish? Is that what you're trying to say? No, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm trying to inject <laughs> no, a, you an are. interesting no, stat. You... No, you are. Yeah, a... you're right. There have been, um, as we've, we, we keep saying, there have been an awful lot of opportunities for... Um, opportunists, opportunists for opportunists. Um, there have been an awful lot of stages, well, the kind of stages, transi- transitional stages, which 
Uh, most Grand Tours will be won by the, the usual suspects of breakaway specialists or sprinters. And here it's been a, a really kind of motley assortment of riders and also a lot of climbers getting into breaks. Uh, Valerio Conti is essentially a climber. I mean, he's got fantastic pedigree, had fantastic pedigree as an amateur. Um, the Italian cycling scene has been waiting for him to break through for um, two or three years now. Um, he rubbed shoulders with the likes of Davide Formolo when he was an amateur and really probably rated more highly than Formolo. Um, and he's extremely impressive like in in a laboratory. You know, physic- Physiologically, he's um, quite an impressive specimen um, but hasn't really been able to, well, find his feet in the pro ranks thus far but I think it start, things started to turn for him at the Giro this year he had a very very good Giro um, without getting remarkable results but he was noticeable at the front on a lot of stages particularly climbing stages and um, and I think something's really clicked for him now he read a good Dauphiné as well and um, to stay away as he did was extremely impressive it was and he said in his press conference afterwards that um, he really wants to make himself into a Grand Tour rider um, and this is only the beginning and, and, and he felt that uh, he wanted to pick a particular stage that he thought he had a chance on and he felt he had a better chance on a day like this than perhaps on one of the uphill finishes where um, really the likes of Quintana and Froome and Valverde are going to be racing and, and limiting the chances for breaks to stay away. So yeah, an impressive breakthrough victory for him. But the other talking point of the day was the, how big the gap got it's the longest stage of the Vuelta today, 213 kilometres. When you compare that to the Giro and even the Tour, it's not excessively long, but it's quite a lot longer than some of the days that we've had so far and certainly some of the days to come. The break by the line was nearly 34 minutes, but it was 20-odd minutes, 18 minutes, 20 minutes most of the day. It's almost like the peloton was making a bit of a point because that's kind of snail's pace riding, really, when you look at the average speed. Yeah, and it becomes a hard sell. A stage like today becomes a hard sell when you set it against the much more spectacular, shorter stages that we've seen. Having said that, um, you know we have, or certainly when I've been speaking to Richard, we've, we've kind of raved about the format of the Welter and we've suggested that really this is the way that Grand Tours ought to go in future. I spoke to Patrick Lefebvre this morning, the Essex Quick Step manager, never short of an opinion or 20. Um, and I asked him whether he was in agreement with or he endorsed this very novel idea of a, of a grand tour almost without sprint stages and without sprinters without sprints sprint teams which is essentially what this welter is and Patrick Lefebvre in his usual very laconic um, way said to me this is not the cycling I like this is terrible <laughs> <laughs> well, honest at least there. And um, just looking at the results, the Conti's time for 213 kilometres was 5 hours 29, give or take a few seconds. The Peloton came in in just over 6 hours, I think 6 hours and 3 minutes. So that's an average speed of 35.2 kilometres an hour. Now, at my best, that's the sort of pace that I could have kept up with. I know you're wincing there, Daniel. You could no, see no, that no, coming no. a mile off. But uh, yeah. um, that's not really Grand Tour racing speed is it they really did sort of take a day off and no, you can't begrudge them a day off no though, and and you know that's one of the beauties of grand tour racing isn't it i mean um in the same way that test match cricket the one that you know you talk to people who are passionate about test match cricket they say oh, i you know i love it when nothing happens and in the same way that you know some people love love kind of hyper realistic films in which nothing happens and they're just real <laughs> sort of um, kitchen sink dramas where the, the the appeal is almost in the boredom um and that almost, almost kind of vindicates people. In, well, you know, when people have strange tastes and they sort of say, oh, you know, I love Grand Tour Cycling. Everyone say, what are you talking about? And they say, well, I love it. You know, I kind of love it. Love the fact they're boring. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what kind of point I'm trying to make here. But, mate, you know, it's, it's an integral part of, of Grand Tours. And, you know, it ebbs and flows. And, you know, I spoke to Christian Prudhomme today. He was visiting the Vuelta because we had an announcement about the... The start next year in Nîmes, um, obviously a French town, so Prudhomme was there. And um, talk to him about, you know, has he been inspired or taken anything from this well to watching it? Is there, are there any things that he would like to apply to the Tour de France? He said, well, no. You know, I think that the, he thinks the Giro, the Welter and the Tour have really found their own identities. No one's trying to copy they're not trying to copy each other. They have different geography. And the Vuelta has found its niche as kind of this gimmicky, made-for-TV, synthetic 
you know, kind of the 2020 of, of Grand Tours. Yeah, and as you say, Daniel, you know, um, good things come to those who wait, I suppose. And we can't criticise on the one hand. I mean, I've, I've made the point sometimes that when a Grand Tour has multiple mountaintop finishes and only a, a handful of contenders, you really see the same pattern re- repeated day after day. Um, you can't criticise on the one hand for having too many mountaintop finishes and then on the other hand criticising when there's a sort of run-of-the-mill transitional day. You, you just remind me of something else that Padre Lefebvre said this morning. He said, oh, I don't, it is always the same riders every day, the f- same four riders. <laughs> but of course, you know, that's what we get for a week or more generally at the Tour de France, isn't it? It, it is indeed. Well, let's listen to um, a couple of the riders who made the break today. Before he signed off from the Vuelta for this year, Richard Moore spoke to Sergei Lagutin, who, of course, won a stage last week or at the beginning of this week, losing track of days already. And uh, Michael Gurgel, who is a young rider, 22 years old, Austrian rider with the Tinkoff team. So Lagutin, I think, is the oldest rider in the race, and Gurgel must be one of the youngest, if not the youngest. So um, Richard spoke to Sergei Lagutin and Michael Gurgel. Sergei, a couple of days after your, your stage win, um, how do you reflect on that? It was, a, it was a great day for you. Well, you know, I feel more comfortable now, more uh, confident, I would say. Uh, I don't have any more pressure. You know, I think whole team have no pressure. We, we got the stage. That was a minimum um, goal for us, you know. Now just whatever is coming, it's extra. We'll be happy for it. We definitely will try again, you know, every single day we'll try to go to the break and play our our opportunity. Uh, you, you've got a strap on your arm, I noticed, um, and you crashed quite heavily on stage two, didn't you? Yes, I did. The fir- uh, yeah, second stage I crashed and, yeah, still suffering from the pain, but it's getting better. I, I noticed as you came out of the, the bus you winced a little bit. I think you've got a pro- problem with your rib maybe? Yeah, my ribs are really bad on me. Like it's really hurts. I constantly in a painkiller. So tomorrow we go to the hospital to to check, you know, X-ray and. So it didn't affect you too much though on the, you know, on the stage that you won. I mean, on that climb, did it? How how did it affect you on on the climb? No, I I can see like I sitting not straight. You know, my shoulders moving, my back. You know, I just all twisted. I think it's all because of the crash. You know, it's you know it's painful, but. What else he can do, Sergei? You have uh, raced uh, with a. You, you represent Russia now, Uzbekistan. I was speaking to your press officer Philip earlier. He was saying that your parents are, are Russian, but you were born in Uzbekistan. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my parents was Russian. I was born in Uzbekistan, and you know it was USSR. So everybody was we all kind of live in the same country, and then, and then everybody get separated, you know, split. But yeah, I will, went to Russian school. I speak Russian, and I always feel like I'm Russian 100. percent and uh, you, are you, you got a contract for next year yet? Are you still looking for, for something for next year? Yeah, I'm still looking, you know. I didn't have anything officially yet, you know, just, you know, some rumors, some words. Uh, but, yeah, nothing, nothing officially. Any interest? I mean, are you aware of interest out there? And I guess the stage win will, will have helped you. Well, of course, I would like to be in a world tour level, you know. Uh, we'll see. My manager's working for her and we'll, we'll see. How's your Debbie Grand Tour going? Yeah, actually the, the last day was really hard. I woke up and I had a sore throat, but uh, so far the legs are really good and I'm happy with how it's going here, yeah. Is that the big challenge, staying healthy? Yeah, of course, you have to take care really of your body because uh, it's an exceptional situation, of course. Uh, but yeah, uh, sometimes, you know, you, you maybe have an air condition or something and then you immediately feel uh, pain in the throat or whatever, but what's you have to take care, yeah. What's your specific job here? Yeah, to take care of Alberto, uh, of course, and uh, that's our main goal. How is, I mean, what's it like for you as a, a young guy starting out in his career to be riding alongside somebody like Alberto? Yeah, f- for sure, it's really nice, ex- uh, especially in Spain because he's a superstar here. And, or, yeah, everywhere, but the, it's his home, and the people are really cheering for him, and it's really nice to ride with him. What's he like as a as a leader? A ah, really nice guy. Uh, he he uh, accepts your work, your work, and he's really happy with uh, uh, that what we are doing for him. And yeah, it's really nice to work for him. Can Contador still win the Vuelta? I guess so, that's why we're here, yeah. The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Eurosport, the home of cycling.
Thank you to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast all year and every day through the Vuelta a España, as they have done through all three Grand Tours this year. I'm sure everybody back at home is watching the live coverage with Carlton Kirby and Sean Kelly. Uh, thanks also to Rafa, our other main sponsor. Um, Daniel sporting a very smart pair of Rafa jeans today. Can tell from the turn up and the little the signature pink line. Very nice. Would you have turned them up? I bet you wouldn't have turned them up, would you, Lionel? Um, a bit old for turning them up, although I do. I have turned them up occasionally. Anyway, um, very smart jeans. Uh, Daniel, Sergei Lagutin and Michael Gurgel there, two riders who are in the break. I think Richard spoke to Lagutin this morning or Gogol this morning and Lagutin a couple of days ago maybe. But um, both riders who've been on the lookout for a new team for next year. Gogol obviously because uh, Tinkoff are folding. Do we know where he's going? I think he's going to Trek. I think he's going to Trek. And I think Trek are going to announce their new signings, a whole gamut of new signings at the end of the Vuelta. I think that's the plan. Um, Gogol very very strong in this world so very very strong today um, he announced this morning on the on the Tinkoff bus that he was going to get into the break and sure enough so he did a um, bit of bit of transfer I, I had a cracking story today about a Lamprey rider <laughs> I had a cracking story about Rui Costa ah um, so Rui Costa is leaving Lamprey and um, which is the former world champion yeah, not and actually and racing that, here though no, is he? and I'm pretty sure he's, uh, and, and his wife is acting as his agent and um, I heard that she's been phoning up... Well, she phoned up one team manager in particular. And I'm going to withhold the name of the, the team in question. And um, she, she phoned up one team and, and the team manager said, OK, so how much is he looking for? And she said a million euros. And the team manager responded, OK, well, you know, there's no chance, <laughs> there's no chance of um, him joining our team at that price. And she then said almost immediately, OK, what about 500,000 euros? <laughs> This sounds like my sort of negotiating skills. In, in the end, Costa will be paying to ride for this team, whoever they are. All very much unconfirmed. The kind of rumours, the kind of the, the kind of tawdry speculation that you know is, is common at this time of year. The, the sort of rumours that get cooked up on a long hot day in Spain in uh, August or early September. Exactly. So, if Rui Costa's listening, which I'm sure he's not, um, apologies. <laughs> Well, let's talk a bit about the Vuelta. It's my first day here. Um, I had a bit of a shocker getting here, um, unfortunately. I decided to meet Richard for a coffee in Bilbao um, after landing because he had a couple of hours to kill after the start before catching a flight. So I had a very nice uh, coffee and a catch-up with Richard. And then, unfortunately, my sat-nav doesn't recognise the roads of the Basque Country. They must have built some new motorways between San Sebastian and, and this corner up here. I found myself crossing over the border into France at one point. Then that meant I was on the wrong side of the race. Of course, my car didn't have the the golden sticker on the windscreen. Daniel, you're shaking your head. You know what this is like, trying to get into the Grand Tour bubble without the the right credentials. And um, so I had to stand and watch the race by the roadside and then battle my way in. Oh, it was, it was, it it felt like that at at one point. (laughs) Anyway, to tell you who had an even worse day than you today, Kaya Rural. Kaya Rural. It was their home stage. They're based in Pamplona. They're based in the north of Pamplona. Movistar are based in the south. It's like the old firm divide of Pamplona. Um, there are, two, are there two football teams in Pamplona? Osasuna and maybe another. Anyway, this is cycling's equivalent of whatever rivalry between football teams might exist in Pamplona. Um, Kaya Rural really were desperate to get a guy in the break today and yesterday. Um, things didn't go too well yesterday. Their bus also broke down. They have to, had to have a team meeting in a cafe alongside the start, with surrounded by punters, um, <laughs> which is probably great for the punters, not for the riders. And um, today, they obviously tried to get in the break. They didn't manage. And, um, yeah, there were, there were quite a lot of dark faces. Uh, and I'm not talking about their, their suntans <laughs> at the finish. They were, it was all looking fairly gloomy um, around the Cairo Rural bus this evening because I think they had quite a long drive to the hotel and um, they have quite a quite a, a volatile or well, certainly a fairly outspoken team manager and um, I understand that a few days ago he wasn't too thrilled with their performance in the Vuelta so far so um, yeah it could be an interesting evening for those guys but Not- Hugh Carthy Hugh Carthy their British rider I think is going to target tomorrow's stage and I think he's going to try and get in a break tomorrow well, Cagliari are um, 
not exactly in the same league as Movistar, are they? Really, it's a, it's not a rivalry of equals. It's very much sort of Premier League and sort of League One or League Two. Um, but uh, what would be the equivalent? It's kind of Notts Forest, Notts County, not even. Po- uh, possibly. I mean, Movistar aren't really. Not, I mean, they've been going since the seventies almost, haven't they? <laughs> if you look at all their guys, it's, this, this really, this the footballing analogies, we really should knock on the head. Um, another team that that does need to do something is uh, our, the, the, the team that are staying here with us, Cannondale Drapak, who are yet to win a World Tour race this season. They've lost Simon Clark. I mean, today was the sort of stage that would have been absolutely perfect um, for Simon Clark. Any idea but, how Andrew Tulansky is going, whether there's any chance of him getting in a move when the mountains come again? Well, they're yet to win a World Tour race, but um, you know, you look at the World Tour rankings, they're actually not doing too badly, and this is uh, this kind of underlines um, how sort of well, illogical in some respects the World Tour rankings are. And this is something that not many people are really talking about at the moment. But the World Tour, for one team in particular, and that's Dimension Data, this is a major source of concern because they're, they're cut well adrift at the bottom of the World Tour rankings. And they, that will mean that they're reduced to candidate status for the World Tour next year. And they're going to be up against um, the, the Bahrain team. Mm-hmm. And possibly there's one other. Is it the Chinese team? The, 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 well, Lamprey are going to become Chinese. Um, anyway, I've, I've gone off at a bit of a tangent there, but things are looking. Well, I have looked a little bit bleak for Candel on this welter. Certainly, with the you know with the the artillery they've brought to this welter, they you would have imagined they might have well got a stage win. They haven't, um, but they are doing better than some. Aside from the um, the risk of losing world tour status i mean the world tour ranking doesn't penetrate people's thinking at all does it it's, it really has no profile whatsoever and i i couldn't tell you who's leading it as, as a team at the moment i mean that just shows you i'm not saying that that i'm necessarily the the arbiter of everything that should be on people's radar but the fact that it doesn't readily come to mind who might be leading the world tour rankings or even the individual and world tour rankings i mean no it, and the fact that dimension data are at the bottom and quite a long way from the the next team um shows how arbitrary and and as i said slightly illogical the rankings are because they've actually had quite a good season a by most season. by most measures but unfortunately for them world tour rankings are heavily weighted towards a perf- performances on general classification in stage races and on that front they've done pretty much nothing all season well yeah i mean several stage with five stage wins at the tour de france and it just highlights how uh, fierce the glare of publicity is on the tour de france compared to um, a lot of other races and really a stage win in the tour is worth you know any number of top five or top ten placings in whether it be one day races or stage races um, but you may accrue the same number of points from consistency, but really it's wins that count. Um, the Vuelta goes into France tomorrow, um, on to the Col d'Orbisque. The climbing starts again. Um, what should we be looking out for tomorrow, do you think? A lot of very hard climbs. The Sude is very difficult, and the Mario Blanc is one of the hardest climbs in the Pyrenees. It's not long, but it's very, very straight. Uh, riders never like that when there are almost no hairpins, I don't think, on the Mary Blanc from that particular side. And it's about a 10% gradient, steady 10% gradient for four or five kilometres. Um, so that will cause, I imagine, quite a lot of damage, or it could cause a lot of damage, particularly if a team like Tinkoff decides to throw the kitchen sink at Movistar and Sky, which they might well do. I mean, uh, Alberto Contador is really drinking in the Last Chance Saloon, isn't he, as far as the general classification is concerned. So that might happen, in which case we're going to get a, a very, very spicy race indeed, aren't we? Well, talking of drinking in the Last Chance Saloon, Daniel, it's, it's nudging 10 o'clock here in Spain. We ought to go and uh, try and get some dinner. I'm looking forward to having a nice meal this evening. It looks like the sort of place that may turn out something half decent. What should I be looking out for on the menu? In the Basque country, you, you would usually be eating pinchos. Well, pinchos is a real tradition of the Basque country. It's kind of tapas with a Basque twist. Um, last night in Bilbao, we, we had a... So a few nights ago in Asturias, we'd had fabada, which is kind of a bean soup. Um, last night in the Basque country, we had the Basque equivalent. Um, I can't remember what it was called. Albadia, al, albadia maybe. Anyway, um, Alubadia. Alubadia, I think. 
um, which was pretty good. Which was pretty good. Um, but again, the, the Basque country is quite it's quite varied and um, yeah, it's sort of hom- um, heterogeneous. Um, different parts of Basque country have different specialities. So who knows, Lionel? Well, let's go and see, shall we? We'll go and place our order. It, it's just gone ten o'clock, so they'll just be opening, won't they? Right, Daniel, let's uh, catch up again at the Welter tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lionel. Cheers. Cheers.